Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day today. So today I'd like to discuss what I would consider to be one of the most commonly misunderstood topics in chemistry, and that is resonance. So take a look at these two structures that are on your screen and notice them. Notice their similarities. Notice their differences. Notice the symbol that is placed in between them. And see if you can sort of draw some conclusions about what you think these structures might be intended to represent. Now, me, myself, personally, without any chemistry knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, if I look at these two structures, what comes to mind to me as like some kind of dynamic process where you have the structure on the left that exists for a little while and then it converts back to a structure on the right and that's like a spontaneous process and it's just kind of back and forth like a tennis match. <clears throat> but that is actually an incorrect conclusion. This um, drawing is actually not intended to represent any kind of dynamic process. This molecule, and I say this molecule because there's only one of them, it's called the, or it, it's really not a molecule, it's a polyatomic ion, it's called the acetate ion. And there is only one acetate ion. So these two structures are intended to show you one chemical species. So why do we have two structures to show one chemical species? Well, the answer to that is because our drawing capabilities are limited. I mean, we already understand the rules for drawing Lewis dot structures and we don't want to violate those rules in any way. And so sometimes we actually show more than one structure to represent a single chemical entity, which is what resonance forms are. So resonance forms are not real. These two structures, they're called resonance forms of the acetate ion. Resonance forms are not real. They are imaginary. They are a tool that people used that people use to depict a single chemical entity. And so let's talk about what's different about these two structures. Now, before, well, actually, let's talk about what's similar about them. So they both have the same chemical formula, C2H3O2 minus, and notice how they're drawn. They're drawn uh, in such a way such that what's bonded to what is the same between the two of them. The connectivity of the atoms is exactly the same. The only thing that's different about them uh, is in this uh, three atom system where, where we have the carbon bonded to these two oxygens. So uh, I'm going to call the oxygens one and two uh, just to keep things clear and simple, ideally. <laughs> and in the structure on the left, oxygen one has three lone pairs, a single bond to the carbon, and a minus one formal charge, while the oxygen two has two lone pairs, a double bond, and a zero formal charge. And in the structure on the right, it's the opposite. Oxygen one is the one with the double bond and two lone pairs and zero formal charge, and oxygen two is the one with three lone pairs, a formal charge of minus one, and the, uh, the single bond to the carbon atom. So why do we have two different structures to represent the same thing? That is the question. And to understand that, you need to understand the nature of double and triple covalent bonds. So let's talk about that a little bit. So if you think any single covalent bond, so imagine a single covalent bond, one pair of electrons shared between two atoms, that single covalent bond is called a sigma bond. This is a Greek letter. Uh, sigma. So any single bond is composed of a sigma bond, which basically is just a head-on overlap of orbitals, which we'll talk about in, in more detail later on in, in, in another video. Now let's imagine we have a double covalent bond. Now if we look at this structure, it looks like those two bonds in that double covalent bond are equivalent, but the truth is that they're not equivalent at all. One of those two bonds in that double bond is a sigma bond. It's a head-on overlap of those two orbitals. And the other bond, the double, or the second bond rather, uh, is something called a pi bond. So a double covalent bond is composed of one sigma bond and one pi bond. And the pi bond is actually a sideways overlap. So remember that sigma, that was the head-on overlap. The pi bond is a sideways overlap of p orbitals. And so <clears throat> if we look at a triple bond, for instance, uh, a, a triple bond has one sigma bond and two pi bonds. So we have a sigma bond, 
a pi bond, and then a second pi bond. So these bonds are actually not all equivalent, and there's nothing in a Lewis dot structure that would tell you that. Um, you need to just understand that by digging deeper into chemistry. <laughs> Any experienced chemist who looks at a Lewis dot structure that has a double or a triple bond understands that those bonds are not necessarily equivalent that we have again I'll repeat it one more time and then we'll move on <laughs> we have for a double bond we have a sigma bond and a pi bond and for a triple bond we have a sigma bond and two pi bonds so why am I hammering this point over and over again well when you have these pi bonds and you have these sideways overlaps of p orbitals, you start to build a network of parallel p orbitals. And when you build a network of parallel p orbitals, um, electrons that reside in those p orbitals, uh, in some cases, can actually be delocalized or shared among that entire chain, that entire network of overlapping, or not overlapping, but of parallel uh, p orbitals. So <clears throat> why is this important for resonance? Well, again, if you look at these two structures, right, you've got oxygen one. Let's, uh, let's talk about the structure on the left for just a moment. So you've got oxygen one, you've got that carbon atom to which it's bonded, and then you have oxygen two. So if you look at that structure, and then you look at the structure on the, on the right, all we've really done to get from the structure on the left to the structure on the right is to simply move the electrons around. And we haven't moved any of the single bonds around. The single bonds are basically fixed. It's only the double bond and the lone pair electrons that we've messed with. So that brings me into the first rule of resonance structures, <clears throat> which is that resonance structures only differ in the position of pi electrons, in other words, electrons that belong to pi bonds, and non-bonding electrons, which are lone pair electrons. So again, resonance forms can only differ in the position of pi and non-bonding electrons. Everything else about them has to be exactly the same. It has to be the same atoms connected to the same atoms, and all of the atoms are going to be shown in the exact same place. So in other words, that carbon is that carbon. That hydrogen is that hydrogen. That oxygen is that oxygen. These are two forms that represent the same exact structure. So that's rule number one. They can only differ in the position of pi and non-bonding electrons. The second rule is that resonance forms must be legitimate Lewis dot structures. In other words, we can't violate the octet rule or the duet, the duet rule in the case of hydrogen, unless it's one of those rare exceptions like boron or something like that. Um, and also, formal charge has to be taken into account. So my last video was all about formal charge, so I would highly recommend watching that if you don't understand it. And uh, in other words, the rule of formal charge, there's two rules. Uh, the first is that the sum of the formal charge must be equal to the charge of the molecule or the polyatomic ion. And the second rule of formal charge is that, uh, well, I'm drawing a blank here. Second rule of formal charge. Come on, Ben, you can do this. <laughs> So the sum must equal, it'll come to me, the sum of the, of the formal charges must be equal to the charge of the, of the polyatomic ion or the molecule. And the second rule is that it just came to me. So <laughs> the second rule is that if there are multiple Lewis dot structures possible, you're going to choose the one that has, or ones, that have the fewest number of non-zero formal charges. So in other words, zero formal charge all around is the best. Um, and when that's, if that's not possible, then you're going to go with the uh, fewest number of non-zero formal charges. In the case of both of these structures, um, they both have one atom with a non-zero formal charge, which is the oxygen, and there's an understood zero for the formal charge of the rest of them. So again, uh, we've gone over two rules so far. One is that resonance forms can only differ in, in the position of pi and non-bonding electrons. And the other rule is that they must be legitimate. Lewis dot structures. Um, the third rule of resonance forms is that resonance forms may not necessarily be equivalent to one another. In, in, these, in, in the uh, acetate ion example, the resonance forms were equivalent. However, um, that's not necessarily um, the case all around. If you look at uh, these two structures here, 
Um, these are resonance forms. Again, they satisfy all those rules. They differ only in the position of pi and non-bonding electrons. And they also, um, they're legitimate Lewis dot structures. There's not like a carbon with 10 bonds on it or anything like that. And, um, but they're not equivalent to one another. They're not equivalent to one another. So oftentimes resonance forms are equivalent, but they don't have to be. So that is basically the lesson on Lewis dot, or on, uh, on resonance structures. Um, if you want to take a look at some more resonance structures, um, I know I just gave you two examples where there were two resonance forms, um, but if you look at this example, um, there's actually three resonance forms. So sometimes there are several resonance forms, and most of the time uh, you'll see structures, and um, most of the time there's only one possible structure and there's no chance. In other words, there's no three carbon or, or, or three atom network uh, over which these pi electrons can be delocalized. So that may have been a little heavy for you, that lesson, um, but in a future video, I'm gonna talk about sigma and pi bonds, uh, which will, will, will discuss the actual orbital makeup of these pi bonds that are giving rise to this phenomenon that we call resonance. So, okay. Um, Thank you so much for watching. I know I kind of got stumped on my own rule there for the, for the formal charge thing. Could just be jitters in front of the camera. I don't know. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you found it helpful. Um, please leave me as much feedback as you want. I can certainly handle it, even the rough, uh, tough love criticism type stuff. Um, and also, uh, I'm on Twitter, by the way. I don't really promote it very much. I only have like 14 followers to, our, to my name, uh, but I'm on Twitter. If you can find me at Ben's Chem Videos on Twitter, um, I'm trying to be more active on it and I'm trying to get more, you know, obviously get more views and stuff like that. So please visit my Twitter, follow me if you would, show me some love, tweet me, do whatever you want. And all right, I hope you have, again, I hope you found it helpful. So, all right, have a good one.